Our next panel is Beyond PGP, protecting reporters on an institutional level, which I'm hoping will build on some of the things we talked about right before this. And I'm gonna introduce our moderator and panelists. Our moderator is Marsha Hoffman. She's an attorney in private practice in San Francisco where she litigates, writes, and speaks about a broad range of technology law issues, including computer security, electronic privacy, and free expression. She previously was a senior staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where she's currently special counsel, um, and is a non-residential fellow at the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society. She is also an adjunct professor at UC Hastings College of Law, which makes me wish I was still in law school. Um, more, okay. Nabiha Sayed is an associate at Levine Sullivan Koch, 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 Koch and Schultz, LLP. She was previously the First Amendment Fellow in the New York Times Company's legal department. She co-founded and directed Yale Law School's Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic, and she has a master's degree in comparative media law and policy from Oxford, where she was a Marshall Scholar. Next to her, we have Morgan Marquis Bois, who's a security research and researcher and director of security for First Look Media and a contributor to The Intercept. He's also a senior researcher and technical advisor to the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs. He previously worked on the security team at a small company known as Google. He's a member of the Freedom, Press, Freedom of the Press Foundation's Technical Advisory Board. Next to him, we have Shenny Jardin, who's founding partner and co-editor of Boing Boing and a longtime online journalist. She's also a member of the Freedom of the Press Foundation's board and has been a contributor to NPR, Wired, The New York Times, LA Times, Guardian, CNN, MSNBC, and many other online outlets and print outlets. Shenny's work focuses on technology, culture, and digital media. And finally, we have Jack Gillum, who's a reporter on the Associated Press's DC Investigations Desk, focusing on the intersection of technology and privacy. Some of his work utilizes computer-assisted reporting, and he's also a web developer and programmer. He previously was a database editor at USA Today. So without further ado, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, coming out this morning, everybody. Um, I'm thrilled to get to moderate this panel. It's full of just absolute stars. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is that you all are involved with working um, with very different types of media organizations. And just to kick it off, I'd be curious to hear everybody's thoughts about how, um, from your perspective, you believe media organizations can best support journalists on an institutional level. Do you well, want to start, Shani? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll tackle that. Um, Boing Boing is, uh, is my home base, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Boing Boing, uh, we began 25 years ago this year as a, a print zine. We've always been a labor of love. We only turned into a business in, I think, 2003, uh, three years after we went from print to being a blog, a website, back when they were called weblogs. And we still remain uh, a small, you know, I say this jokingly, but it's accurate, a distributed anarchist collective. There's, uh, I think, five core partners. I, sometimes I lose track. But uh, five of us who are basically actively involved in managing the business and managing the editorial. We're all over the world. Uh, and there's a, a smattering of contractors and, uh, you know, friends and freelancers who help us produce this. But we're an awfully small organization. We've never taken a dollar of VC funding. And it's sort of like um, your cool, weird friends, uh, you know, record shop in the 80s. It's, we're, we're not, you know, Walmart. So we're very lucky that some, uh, you know, like Cory Doctorow, one of my partners in particular, uh, his whole life is really dedicated to to the issues that we're talking about here, and, and he tends to lead internally a lot of our, you know, a lot of the good decisions that we've made about security and about protecting our users' security. Um, but, uh, you know, when in the earlier panel, uh, people were talking about, well, you have free software on one side of the spectrum, which works well, but is sometimes 
difficult for non-tech users to wrap their, their heads around. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have really well-funded tools that, um, that, that have a, an, an opaque uh, layer that makes it very easy for end users. Those cost a lot of money. Um, somewhere in between, there's a gap for freelancers, for instance, in our organization who, you know, they don't know from Linux but they do need to be able to communicate securely. And I, I think, I think uh, it's really easy in the interest of saving money, in the interest of just fast, 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 which we live and die by, to use free tools that are neither of those things and they're not secure. So there, there's a real temptation to get sloppy. Right. And you know, Morgan, you are working with First Look Media, which is in the enviable position of, of getting to build um, a media organization from the ground up with technical assistance from, from people like you and from Micah Lee, who are very technically sophisticated. And you also come at this from an interesting perspective because you are a security professional, but you also do reporting. Um, what is your take on this? Yeah, um, so we also just hired Aaron Clark from the mm -hmm. Tor Project. Um, so gr growing a security team actually, I think, is in terms of the way a news organization can institutionally support its reporters, uh, what, I've, what I've actually found to be very interesting is the, the kind of glue in between sort of, I guess, reporters and security resource. So I actually, uh, what I sort of noticed is um, so joining uh, a media organization from 15 years of being a security engineer um, for mostly sort of large corporates or consulting and that sort of thing, is the, mm, not, perhaps there is a lack of ease with which uh, media organization and reporters consume security resource, uh, which has actually been very interesting to me. Um, so I think having, having it abundant and available um, in, a, in a news organization is a really great idea, because one of the things that I've noticed is, is that reporters mainly want to report. Um, there, are, there are people who uh, take certain amount of enjoyment and pride in learning how to use secure communication tools and actually sort of enjoy the geekery around it. Um, for a lot of people, though, this is simply an inconvenience, right? Um, I mean, I ended up talking to someone who, who was telling me that they'd tried to labor through learning various types of encryption tools and so forth uh, themselves, and they'd, they'd given up after sort of a morning because they, they had stuff to write, you know? Um, and, and so I kind of spend a lot of time thinking about how I and my team can protect our journalists kind of as seamlessly as possible. Um, admittedly, when you don't have a massive amount of institutional cruft and overhead to deal with, that allows you to be a bit more fluid in this type of endeavor. Speaking of which, Jack, you work for the AP, which is a much larger organization. How, how, does, how does your experience differ? So, I mean, can you hear me okay? This is like 500 pounds. Um, I, mean, the, I mean, the AP was, is, is so old it was literally, we were at Custer's last stand. I mean, we're, a, we're, an, old, we're an old news organization. We're all around the world. And, you know, change goes slowly. And, and, and the AP, you know, to its credit, has done a lot internally to try to, you know, particularly Snowden, to get up to speed. I mean, our uh, Chris Segoyan had pointed out that the FBI impersonated an, an AP story. Our general counsel sent a scathing letter to the FBI about that, saying that it, you know, fundamentally undermines, you know, the independence of a free press. And we do take this very seriously, but I think there's sort of two things, and this is not really speaking about the AP, but other you know, large news organizations I work for, or news organizations who are owned by big companies, is that there's sort of two things we need to think about here before we get into the tools. A, we need to stop being cheap. And what makes me irritated about this, I mean, quite frankly, is that we spend so much money on making sure the doors are locked. We have all these fancy proximity cards. We give, you know, whatever you you know like fancy ways to you know to to physically secure stuff but then when it comes to like you know pgp just alone which by the way free tools are great but when we use microsoft outlook and microsoft exchange trying to force feed pgp with that is a nightmare and i have you know have a little bit of a cs background and if i can't do it i you know, sure as heck somebody who's been working there 30 years and doesn't know how to use an iPhone, I, I feel sorry for them, and that's the whole issue we've come up to. And, and, and it shouldn't be that difficult, but that's, there are paid solutions. The other thing I think, you know, the AP, we have a lot of reporters in countries who don't exactly have a First Amendment, <laughs> and, you know, who could, you know, either they or their sources will literally be killed if, you know, some information gets out in some of these countries. 
And I think we need to have this mindset of security that it's beyond just the tools. It's not an either or. It's not just the tools. It's not just you know the parking garage in Roslyn. It's it's this idea that in you know we live in almost now 2015. It's clear that you know our government, other governments collect you know, a massive metadata trail about our lives that, you know, even just getting to that parking garage, who knows between the Metro card we tap and the 50 surveillance cameras that pick us up and, you know, the three meetings you had with the source in which you used your credit card and they were able to put you at the scene if you went Dutch. We need to think a little better about security and I think just having that mindset before we even get to the tools and realizing that we need to spend money to protect our sources because we owe it to them to do that. I think are two things that it seems obvious, but I think we need to really have that discussion. Well, and that makes me think of, of, of Morgan again, because in your capacity at Google, I believe, you released a study earlier this year finding that 21 of 25 top media organizations have been targeted by state-sponsored hacking. Is that right? Yeah. What, what can we learn from that? What can media um, organizations take away from that? Yes, so, so I've... A primary concern of mine, I guess, has been sort of targeted threats. Like it's, it's important to just think, it's like we've heard a lot about the use of PGP and, and secure communications tools, right? And this, this protects you from a, a specific type of, of threat, of problem, a specific type of actor, right? And, and this, is, this is the type of person who, or actor, that, that, that is listening to your communications as they occur across a telephone, across chat, you know, across, and, you know, However, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying what I would call targeted threats, and these are people that will actively attempt to penetrate a news organization or um, an individual's sort of digital life or devices. Uh, and so, for instance, I've, I've published a bunch of research on, this generally takes the form of, say, a software implant, which, you know, would get installed silently on a device like an iPad or a cell phone, um, and then would do all sorts of wonderful things like turn on the microphone so you can listen to conversations that are ambient to the, the person using it, or turn on the webcam, copy communications, contacts, and that sort of thing. Um, and so obviously this, this level of surveillance is, is desirable um, on people on the previous panel, um, you know, and news organizations and so forth. And so um, what happens is, is people in this sort of so-called post-Snowden world, people are very obsessed with the capabilities of the NSA. However, there's a, there's a whole bunch of governments that are very much in the business of targeted hacking. Um, I mean, the activities of China towards news organizations are sort of reasonably well documented. But yeah, so I mean, essentially, as Marsha said, we discovered that 21 out of 25 news organizations had actually been targeted, if not actually uh, penetrated by state-sponsored, essentially, spies. Um, and I mean, this I guess shows the the ubiquity of this threat. The the ones of the of that top twenty five that had not found to be targeted were people that mainly had a focus on sports and entertainment, uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Um, and, and so I, I I guess it's it's this is we need to not think of these as isolated events. Uh, I mean, this this is reasonably continuous. It's merely the discovery of these actors that are isolated events. And that's the scary thing, right, is that occasionally people slip up and they get noticed, or uh, other more skilled people detect that intrusions have occurred on their network and actually have visibility into the other activities of these actors. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's really a wake-up call for news organizations. Um, it's, it's easier to not look at it because the solution involves, as mentioned, lots of resource, be it security professionals, money, and so forth. But and all these news organizations are just rolling in cash. I hear print journalism is just making mad stacks now. Yeah. I will say, as someone who's positioned in private practice, I hear about these issues only when someone calls me and I get a barrage of questions. Um, and it makes me wonder how much, so when I get these questions, it's often, well, a reporter walked into my office and asked me about tool X, or IT is reporting that we have issue Y. And what do I need to know about this? And I think this kind of ad hoc approach is part of the problem. There needs to be a more systemic, it doesn't necessarily need to be top down, but I think just having this bottom up kind of approach of, okay, well that reporter wants it, so IT go and set him up with whatever he needs is not enough anymore. I mean, there are, there are enough incidences, there's enough evidence to say that this needs to be an institutional solution, even though no one has any money, 
it is probably a priority that I think is worth at least some money, which is more than what it's getting in most organizations right now that I talk to. I, I would love to follow up on that. You represent, as a lawyer in private practice, a number of media organizations. I suspect all sizes, uh, different approaches toward their craft. Mm -hmm. Um, when you get these calls and they're asking you questions about digital security, I, I'd be curious how you approach them, especially considering that, you know, I, I feel like we're in an environment these days where some of the legal protections that we'd like to see for journalists and for sources really aren't as robust as we'd like them to be. And so, you know, on one level, um, the legal protections aren't what we'd like to see, but some of the technical protections maybe have greater potential. How do you navigate those issues? So the questions I tend to get um, come in three big chunks. So the first are complaints about convenience, which kind of came up on that first panel of, you know, someone in my organization is saying, we need to use this, and isn't this just for the national security reporters? Why do I have to do this for everybody? It seems very inconvenient. I can't check my email on my phone. I don't like this. I don't want to do it. And so some in those questions, part of it is just counseling about why it's important and what the importance is for not just your national security reporters, but anyone who crosses a border, mm -hmm. anyone who does a variety of different kinds of reporting. This is important for you, and you need to have this available. Um, the second is kind of this comprehension or comprehensiveness issue. So someone will say, OK, well, I know about encrypted email, uh, so we can set that up. That's all I need, right? And you're like, well, actually, your, your content is, is stored in a variety of means, and there's a variety of forms of, of communication, right? You have chat, you have telephone, you have the storage of your information, you have how you browse, you have everything. And it's not just how you do all of that in the United States, but also when you have bureaus or reporters that are in places like Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, where even having this can be a crime, you need to think about the policies your organization has. If you, if you tell a reporter, yeah, take your computer with PGP on it and just head to Karachi, they may have some problems when they're crossing that border, so you need to think about that. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to actually, I think this is, this is a really, really awesome point, right? Like, the, I, we need to move away from the, the PGP is all you need uh, sort of focus, I think, in, in, in this community, um, away from a tools-based focus. So security is a holistic organizational thing, and there's, there's legal implications, policy implications, and that type of thing. I think the, the greatest value add of having a dedicated security team is not having people around that can teach people to use PGP, but people that can teach reporters to think logically and sanely about security. And that's, that's not being paralyzed by fear of the Chinese government turning on the microphone on your phone, but realizing the likelihood that that threat will happen to you and the steps that you should take to prevent it. I would just, on this point, I think, you know, it's easy to sort of, um, and in fact, you know, colleagues in the, in the industry who don't cover national security or political reporters, for example, it's very easy for them to say, well, I don't cover the NSA, I'm, you know, I, I don't need to worry about this. Incorrect you do need to worry about this for no other reason than whether you're working in government, whether you're, you know, when I say they, whether you, I mean like a source, is either working in government, forget about the federal government, state, local governments. I mean, pr you know, private uh, companies. I mean, I'm sure you've rooted out, you know, leakers before. I mean, the idea is, is that these are people with jobs and mortgages and families to support. And, you know, who's to say that a political source now, for example, won't be somebody when, you know, the, they're, the person they're working for in two years runs for president and drops, you know, the Romney 47% video. And let's say they, they, you know, instead of, you know, riding that wave out, and, and let's say this candidate this time really wants to aggressively go after and sue you and, you know, compel you civilly to produce this. I mean, you know, maybe you can quash that subpoena, maybe you can get thrown away, but but what if it's not? I mean, they'll pull all your outlet contacts and figure out who, you know, who you've been contacting in these last few years. And I think it's just that, I'm not saying that all that means you're gonna have like a, you're gonna be subpoenaed one day, but it, you need to think that if this is somebody who you really care about, which should be all of your sources, it's, it applies to you if you're not just covering, you know, the intelligence community, I think. The issues that we're talking about today are not just a matter of individual hygiene. They're a matter of organizational security hygiene. An organization is only as secure as uh, the weakest person who has access to the CMS, and that could be the cat video blogger, you know? Uh, yeah, the, the other thing I wanted to share, about a year and a half ago, I was in uh, Guatemala for a month, two months, covering the, a, a major genocide trial that was happening there, a historic trial. Uh, and I, I learned a, a lesson in a new way that 
many reporters have learned that you can only be as secure as how low you're willing to go in, in order to talk to a source. So uh, in Guatemala, I learned that, and, and in Guatemala, um, political activism, uh, performing journalism, this is no joke, people die. People die for trying to do the right thing all the time and nobody cares. It's, it's a killer's paradise, as they say. But some of the very, very brave activists who were um, organizing uh, witnesses from, from these uh, massacres to come to court uh, to, to speak their truth, they're communicating over WhatsApp. They're communicating over text. And, and the, uh, the phone carriers there are, it's not a metaphorical monopoly. It, it is, in fact, a monopoly, and it is pretty much directly controlled by the same people who control the government and the military. So how do you go about, how do you go about practicing good reporter OPSEC in a place where people are at extraordinary risk for their actions, but the only way, the absolute only way to make first contact and sometimes um, consecutive contact is to break most of your own rules. And by the way, when I came back from that trip, I had done work that I was proud of, but I also, uh, I remember it was like three days after I came back, and I, this was right before the, the big Snowden, the first big Snowden revelation. I, I uh, logged into a Gmail account that I use uh, for, I know, <laughs> I got the warning uh. that, that my Gmail had been um, compromised by a state-sponsored attacker. And uh, who knows? It, this was my old team, actually. That so this <laughs> you would never tell me who it was. I, now, I, I, to this day, I wonder, I, does Guatemala have an elite uh, band of hackers? Was it China, who's pissed off at something I did long ago about the Tibetan human rights movement? Or was it the US? It sounds like you have a problem with making people angry. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the answer is yes. It's probably all three. That's very interesting. So, so Jack, I understand. You, you mentioned you have a computer science background. Um, yeah, I didn't have any friends as a kid, so <laughs> I really I didn't. So. And you know, I, I think I'm kidding. I think everybody on this panel is is relatively tech savvy. Um, you know, for the first time just a moment ago, Snowden's name actually came up, which I thought would come up like instantly on this panel. But I'm curious how how much you think things have really changed in the post Snowden world. I mean, has that really changed everything, or are we just more aware of the risks? Or I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, I think it's changed quite a bit, for sure. I mean, I, I mean, just the idea of having, I mean, you know, the secure drop. I mean, just going to the front page of the Washington Post, and it's right there on their homepage. I don't think. I'm not saying without Snowden that wouldn't have happened, but it certainly was a big impetus for it. Reporters I talked to, who you know, you know, one point barely know how to open Excel and sort a spreadsheet, are like, I should be a little more secure. What's this PGP thing I hear about? So it's in the milieu. I think people do talk about it, um, but again, it comes down to the tools and how hard they are to use. But you know, I don't, at the same time, I don't think that's a, a barrier. I mean, you know, even institutionally, it, you know, news organizations, I think, you know, even if we don't have like a, uh, a, a site-wide PGP installation, everybody has OTR in their computers, we still, you know, when I was, you know, working with a colleague in a, let's just say, not very friendly country, um, you know, we downloaded and used, you know, first it was Silent Circle, then we used Signal. And, you know, first one was 9.95 a month, the other one is free. And so I feel like it, it's, it's also easy for reporters, you know, to say, well, nobody's installing this on my computer. I can't do it. Well, no, I mean, there's ways you can ad hoc sort of, sort of you know, if you want to make it secure and you understand that, that this needs to be a better OPSEC sort of, you know, environment for yourself. I, I feel like now, since Snowden, there are more tools out there for journalists. Certainly the Freedom of the Press Foundation and others have, like, made this available. You know, EFF and others have, like, you know, here's how you do it. You know, it may be a little bit of a, of a brain power exercise, because again, it's not very easy, but there are tools, you know, even Julia mentioned, you know, the, 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 the scorecard of like, you know, here are the tools you can use and, you know, here are their limitations, here are how good they are. I mean, it's available now, and so let's start using them now. I'm a proud board member of Freedom of the Press Foundation, and uh, just as a, a point of clarification, the organization launched before uh, the Edward Snowden uh, document dump and revelations, mm -hmm. but uh, some of the tools that the organization has uh, worked very hard to make available to reporters and, and some of the support that it has provided to uh, investigative news organizations, uh, that really, it was like, it, it, everything that happened around Edward Snowden sort of created this 
massive tide of public interest that uh, opened up a, a new kind of public awareness for, for why these issues matter to everyone. Did you have yeah, something I, to add? I, I, I do have some uh, feelings on this, which I, I think is because the, the Snowden revelations have meant that people have definitely started threat modeling more widely, which I think is great. Uh, for a lot of people, this has meant that they've been doing it since June 5th, 2013, which is actually not a very long time. Um, additionally, people who aren't trained or experienced in this area, I think, tend to worry about threat in the same way that people who aren't trained to do it worry about risk and that we get freaked out about novelty. Right, like we're really worried about terrorist attacks because they're really visceral and they involve blood and bombs. We're a lot less concerned with car accidents, heart disease, and you know, lung cancer or, or whatever. Um, and, and, uh, well, we're very concerned about <laughs> Ebola, despite like you know, incidents of death in this country being very low. Uh, but I mean, I, as I said, I, I see the same thing in this sort of the post Snowden world, and that I have so many conversations with people that are really concerned with defeating the NSA. And I'd really love to hear why they think the NSA is actually their greatest threat, or why they're being, like, I mean, if you live in America and you think you're being targeted specifically by the NSA, like, your problem is that you're being targeted by an insurmountable adversary with a trillion dollar budget, right? Like, this is, this is worrying. Right, like you should, you should probably have a, a meltdown or something. I mean, I, I guess, <laughs> I, guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is a lot of people are very worried about things that they haven't managed to clarify to me why they think they're actually risks or threats. Um, so I think it's great that people are thinking in this way. I think the conversation will slowly get saner over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. The only time that Boing Boing was ever pwned to my knowledge, to our knowledge, was not by the NSA but by some very bored teenagers who replaced our front page with a photograph of a guy in a, like a rubber suit with penises coming out of it. What is it, it's, it, you know. We call it the cock suit to this day. Well, what is it that Co Corey and actually it, said? Never underestimate someone who is uh, cash poor but time rich. And, <laughs> and Corey was right, and, and it was just a matter of an unpatched installation of, um, I think, movable type which is a whole discussion in and of itself we should have never If I could say one thing too, I mean, I mean, keep in mind, you know, you know pre-Snowden or around the time of Snowden, keep in mind, I mean, the AP was subpoenaed by the Justice Department mm -hmm. for their phone records, for phone records, okay? We were not talking about PGP, I mean, we're talking about e emails that the NSA with, you know, unlimited budget is trying to crack out in Utah. We're talking about phone records and, you know, who, who knows what else the government is trying to get after under this administration or others. And I, and, and, I, I think since then, you know, whether it was that, others, we, we do have this sort of, you know, okay, well, how can we be better at this? Is it slow moving? Yes, but I mean, it's great that since then there, there are tools available. So, but you're right, it's not just about the tool. It's not like the NSA is out to get you. It's just, you know, like I, I was saying earlier, I think you need to have a better idea or just this sort of, just not be stupid about security. You know, like don't, don't you know, if a buddy of mine is, you know, if a colleague is in, you know, a really, you know, adversarial country, don't use your cell phone to make a landline phone call into the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, like, don't don't sit at a Starbucks and use unencrypted Wi-Fi to start e doing, you know what I mean? Like, just little things, but frankly, I think news organizations, and I'm not necessarily speaking about the AP, because we've done a good job, I think, internally of trying to get better, but but others, like particularly like reporters who don't cover Washington, I feel like it's a, it's pretty lackluster just in, in my conversations with them. So on on the subpoena point, uh, that's been one really funny development over the last year, where people say, okay, well, the law is terrible. The Fourth Circuit doesn't have a First Amendment defense anymore, or any reporter's privilege. Uh, so we're just going to use technology instead. That <laughs> encryption is just going to solve everything. And it's not clear to me where that is coming from, because if you get a subpoena, let's game it out. If you're in the Fourth Circuit and you get a subpoena for your content. One of the lessons of Lava Bit is that prosecutors are not afraid to ask you for any keys or any passwords or anything they need to decrypt your information. So they will ask for that. And if you are in the position of having to quash that subpoena, the First Amendment argument that you would make is no longer there in this jurisdiction. And in some cases, there have been people who have used Fifth Amendment arguments to, uh, to try to quash the subpoena. And when it comes to compelled decryption of hard drives or passwords, there is an emerging body of case law that's not exactly favorable. 
Um, there are some rough cases out there that do say, no, in fact, you can't invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege to avoid uh, having to submit de decrypted versions of, of the content. And so it's not clear that any of this tech stuff can really keep you safe from that particular legal threat that exists. It's very helpful for certain kinds of risk, for risk, right? If anyone's trying to have unauthorized access or if it's foreign governments or whatever, but the legal issue is still pretty terrible and it's still something we need to work on. Can, can for I? the non-lawyers in the room, do you wanna just explain a little bit about what the Fifth Amendment situation is? Um, sure, so basically the Fifth Amendment um, protects you against uh, having to provide testimony that would be self-incriminating. And so um, in this like handful of cases, there's a question here about whether having to give up your password or key, um, and courts use them interchangeably, though they're not the same thing, um, would be giving up the contents of your mind, which is testimonial in a way that would invoke the Fifth Amendment privilege. Um, and some courts say, well, if the police already knows that what you have on your laptop is child pornography or evidence of mortgage fraud, um, if they already know, then it fits in within this doctrine called the foregone conclusion doctrine. So the police already knows, so you giving up your password or your key is not gonna give them anything new to go after you. Now, in another universe in which the police just, they have this iPad and they're like, well, you're a bad dude, there's oh. something in it. Uh, <laughs> hand it over, they don't, and they don't know what they're looking for. You're not a bad dude, you're so wonderful. But <laughs> it's hypothetical. Um, then you, it wouldn't, that foregone conclusion doctrine wouldn't necessarily be as applicable, and in those circumstances, courts have come down the other way, saying no, it is testimonial to ask you to open this up and give me the contents of it if they are encrypted. And so that development of that doctrine is still unfolding, but what it means at the end of the day is that when it comes to quashing a subpoena for encrypted content, we don't have a slam dunk argument. So we are very vulnerable when it comes to subpoenas for this stuff, and that's a little, it's a scary universe to be in. Mm -hmm. Jack, did you have something no, you wanted I, to I was just curious if this complicates matter. Was, let's say you know, you're a foreign correspondent and you come back, you know, let's say you, you fly into the Fourth Circuit like you know, to Dulles, and I mean, the, there's the border exception rule with searches. I mean, I'm sure this makes it even more difficult and terrifying. I mean, I have you know, like Customs and Border Protection, all of a sudden, yeah, we're taking your hard drive down. Um, different organizations have been developing different policies around this, but one that I've seen more and more often is having people travel with uh, essentially dummy computers that don't have anything on it. Burner laptop. Exactly. Um, because the border is such a precarious place to be for a variety of reasons, so just don't risk it. And as we've seen, uh, like Jacob Applebaum was one of the first, uh, when, he, when he was coming back and forth, noted security researcher, uh, coming back and forth from Europe into the United States, I believe it was, and from the Mideast. Uh, he was detained by, I think it was Customs and Border, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and his devices were taken away. He was one of the first people involved in security research and uh, journalism to have his devices seized and to be harassed and detained every single time he entered the country. That's right. So maybe we should open it up for questions at this point. Yes, Mr. Segoyan. You don't need a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Retelling it quickly, New York Times reporter, unnamed, speaking to me a, a year and a half ago, he was entering Israel and the Israeli authorities wouldn't allow him into the country until he logged into his New York Times email account and then let them do keyword searches on his corporate email account. Now, he, as he was telling me this, he was really proud of the fact that he used Gmail for everything and he didn't log into his Gmail account so there was nothing that they would get. Mm. Um, Subterfuge. But this seems like a really crazy thing too, uh, and I, I, I understand that this doesn't involve encryption or anything like that, but to the extent that the panelists have thoughts on this kind of practice of not allowing the police to seize your devices, but al allowing the authorities in the United States or elsewhere to log in and do keyword searches for your accounts, it seems like a really bad idea. What are your thoughts? Um, so I, 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 I can actually verify this because uh, I, I went into Israel from Palestine earlier this year, and obviously they were interested. Um, and, and, and so this, this is actually, a, a, I, I think, to a certain group of people, a reasonably known phenomenon in that what I actually did is I 
had a web browser open on my computer in a suspended state that was logged into a mail account that I don't care about, um, which is, is what I did, because I was, I was actually prepared for the fact that they, I mean, and that was the only way I could think about dealing with the problem because of the fact that if there's this like, well, we're not gonna let you fly out of this airport unless you like, I mean, th things start becoming very interesting. Um, I, I'm really wary of trying to solve real world coercion problems with code. It can seem really, really appealing, but I have a feeling it leads you to bad places. Um, <laughs> which I guess is, is I mean, I, I think if you, if you really know what you're doing and you bet that you know the security game better than the Israeli border police, um, which I think is probably not a bet that a lot of people should make, um, <laughs> then, then perhaps you can figure out a way to, to think through this. Um, but I mean, the, I think the short answer is, is that if you're going to a place where you have very real concerns, that it sounds like you should consult someone like prior to going. Um, and that, that, that doesn't just include a security expert, that probably should include a lawyer as well. And, you know, much like getting your shots before you go to the jungle, you know, you should talk to a priest, a rabbi, a security engineer, and a lawyer before you. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody else, do you, do you want to add anything, or are you? Um, I was going to give an example of something that does not work in that situation. Um, so I had an activist friend of mine who went to Morocco and was asked to do exactly the same thing, and she said, okay, I'm going to get back on the next plane, and I'm just going to leave. I will not cross your border. So if I don't cross your border, you have no authority over me to ask me to do this, and that did not go over well. Um, she was in jail for three days. So I would not, so it's not always a successful tactic, so don't do that. Um, otherwise, I mean, the advice would depend from country to country. It would depend on the resources that are on the ground, if there's anything else that we can set up for you. Um, it's just a really fact-specific inquiry, but it is a, it is a thorny one, because borders are pretty terrible places. Mm -hmm. Next question. Hi, Kevin Gallagher. Um, I'm curious what you guys think of the current state of institutional news or organization security when it comes to actually patching security bugs and vulnerabilities, um, you know, making sure that people's systems are updated, responding to things like shell shock and heart bleed, um, and, you know, the role of systems administrators and digital security teams in doing that kind of thing. Sorry, we were distracted because we just noticed something really interesting. I, I, I have a, so in terms of talking about paying for actual security technology, I, I'm happy to answer, I think this is a great question. Um, but, but for instance, this, this phone, uh, it looks like a reasonably crappy Android phone. Uh, they, they cost like 2,500 euros. Um, and it, it, it starts falling into the realm of what I would actually call a real security product. Um, and, and one of the things that it does is it's, it's really bad for taking selfies and Instagramming and all of this sort of thing. But it is actually a really good uh, cellular network anomaly detector. Mm -hmm. And so it just threw a warning saying, oh, there may be an IMSI catcher prison, uh, <laughs> which um, one of the things that it does is it detects if your cell phone is connected to um, cell towers that don't have neighbors, which is sort of a euphemism for someone that's actually got, you know, and Chris will talk to you at length, I think, about stingrays and that sort of thing if you, you collar him afterwards, but someone with a... So I, I'm not sure that this is... I mean, also, having used this as a primary device for a while, I've discovered that the cellular network is super brittle and does, like, all sorts of wacky errors constantly, so it, it might be that. But, like, yes, I, I was asked earlier today if people were like, oh, interesting array of people in this room. Should we, we be more worried than usual about this sort of thing? And I was like, oh, I default to caution most of the time, so... But, yes, that was what I was distracting people with, was the, like, oh, this is... Uh, Strange. And now we so. can take a selfie with my phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, but his question. Was but you want to? Can you repeat? It was you were worried about you know, shell shock and updating, uh, just regular yeah. daily yeah, you know, um, software. How do we make sure that journalists are patching their machines and and the news organizations are upgrading, responding to when bu security bugs and vulnerabilities arise? Uh, my answer to that is good luck. Uh, I I think having a team that's actually tasked with this is a great point. Like, I mean. That's like the most basic piece of security advice I can give to anyone, which isn't like you should do X, Y, Z. It's like just, just make sure you're running the latest, most updated version of the software that you're running. That, that's a really great. Um, so, I mean, this isn't just a news problem, right? This is a everyone in the world using technology problem. 
Um, I think that news organizations realize that they have to do that is a great start. Um, but <laughs> I mean, as someone who's actually been, been doing security engineering and security teams for multiple organizations my whole career, I'm like, I'd be surprised if news organizations were any better than anyone else at this, <laughs> which is not good. Um, so. right. Do you think that any news organizations are particularly good at this? Um, so I was, I was talking before, like, pe there's, there's been a certain amount of uh, recognition, I guess, a first look for, you know, trying to make a good fist of security posture and that sort of thing. Um, and I, I think that's great. I think, I think we're doing, um, you know, a reasonable job so far. I, I have to admit I have a certain amount of admiration for Bloomberg's security team who have had a real security team for 10 years. Um, like, those Bloomberg tablets are pretty secure things, right? Like, and I mean, there, there's a reason for this. Uh, but, but yes, I mean, I, I think they're an example of a news organization that are doing, doing all right on a certain front. Um, but obviously, it, the motivations of the news organization really play into that. Mm -hmm. I think it does go to Chris's point, though, of having a chief security officer just creates a locus in the organization of a person that you can go to whose job it is to be doing this all the time and to be the person that you consult before you fly to Israel or wherever. It just it makes that formalized in a way that I think is important. Mm -hmm. Next question. Thank you. Uh, my name's Matt. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, having this chief security officer or having this crack team that's going to teach you operational security. It's going to teach you tradecraft and spycraft <laughs> as well as infosec. Um, do these people really exist? Are there, organ <laughs> you know, like uh, not everybody is uh, is going to be like a Morgan. So, um, so I was just wondering, like inside a, a news org or as a freelancer, is there someone you can go to hmm. who can give you some Bloomberg-esque assistance? Do you like the EFFs? Yeah, I think there's, there's a variety of organizations that are doing great work on this. I mean, uh, the, the Freedom of Press Foundation, and I think, I mean, Runa is, is over there, and um, Kevin, I think that, you know, they, they actually have started to do that sort of thing. There's From also the Electronic Frontier Foundation. There's, there's also, I can see Carol over there who's done a bunch of security training for journalists, and I mean, there's, Oh, there's the, I mean, oh, hey. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's people in this room. So I mean, I, th there are resources, and I think there's, I mean, I know e Europe has tactical tech, what they do here, it's the Electronic Frontier Foundation and you know, Freedom Press Foundation. So I think reaching out to those orgs and being like, hey, I hear that this stuff exists, what's, and, what's going on? And specifically at the Freedom of the Press Foundation website and at EFF.org, uh, there are, uh, there are, there are like tip sheets of tools and practices that are good for journalists. The surveillance self-defense guide that the EFF released is probably one of the more readable um, and consumable resources on this sort of thing that I've, I've seen in a while. And that was very recently updated too, yeah. which is nice. <laughs> and just, I mean, in terms of security, I mean, even if news organizations don't have like a, a crack, you know, CISO to, you know, tell you how to do all types of spycraft, I think it's an issue of, of for better or worse, it's the real world and their priorities, right? I mean, the, the AP has a wire, and it's a wire that they, you know, it, they, they lock down so heavily that even if I want, like, to get a feed off of, a, like, a, a staging server just to, like, get, you know, for, like, some analytics thing, nope, good luck. Like, you, you, you do not have access to that. They, they put in two-factor authentication, to, so you have, like, a separate code to put in with your password. I mean, they're very serious about it, but at the same time, it's like, well, may, how serious are we about social media accounts? I mean, it's I'm going to be transparent here that you know, as the a, Syrian yeah. electronic army showed, no right. one is particularly good of, at security. Of course, <laughs> and when it came to the the AP, I mean, just to be transparent about it, I mean, we, you know, our Twitter account was hacked, and there was a fake news alert that went out that said that there was an explosion at the White House, and it flash crashed the stock market by like 150 points, like, and that wasn't even the wire. I mean, that was our social media account. So it, I, I think, and it's not to, to necessarily blame the AP. I mean, yeah, I mean, we learned a lot from that, but it's like, I think it, every news organization has their priorities. And, you know, you know is, it, is it the priority keeping the wire up and secure? Okay, then there's these like handful of reporters, you know, Jack and a couple other cantankerous folks who want PGP. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that's the, I think that's maybe the wrong way to look at it. I'm not saying that's the way they do look at it, but I think it's just understanding like the dynamic of a major news organization. It could very well be, I guess what I'm trying to say is they are thinking about it. They read the news just like we do. You know, they have the same boss, you know, that the newsroom has. And, you know, in our case, it's 
you know, he's a First Amendment lawyer, he's a CEO of the AP. Mm. I mean, they're aware of it, and I, I think it's just, you know, even if there's like a slow-moving train, there are tools that you can use in the meantime and just be smart about. I Just just to use an example, and I'm going to gonna pick on the AP, actually. <laughs> um, but I, so, so I've, I've actually helped compromise reporters from a large variety of news organizations, including most of the major ones. Um, and I'm going to use the AP as an example because the guy's name is Chris Brummett, and he actually wrote about it. Um, but he is the Associated Press reporter on the ground in Vietnam. Um, and he was targeted by uh, Vietnamese government actors that have compromised a whole bunch of you know, people that write on Vietnamese constitutional law from other countries and all sorts of things like that. Um, and and they, they were actually pretty smart about targeting him because they, they were inviting him to a human rights conference and offering free flights and hotels, which is, you know, most people in this room will admit is you know, sort of an alluring thing for people in a certain industry. Um, and like, I, I actually, he ended up contacting me and I, I worked with him. And I mean, what was, what was useful about this, as I said, he actually, he actually wrote a piece for AP about, about his targeting by this government. Because um, most, most people actually sort of prefer not to talk about it when, I mean, we're sort of slowly moving past that. Um, but I, I think that's part of it, as you said, you know, people at the top and that sort of thing, they're, you know, First Amendment lawyers and they, they understand this problem. Um, I think we're starting to move to a culture where reporters uh, are more inclined to talk about their own targeting. But I think historically there's actually been a feeling of like, you know, we're not the news, we're, we're you know, simply sort of a, a, a mouthpiece or a reflection or a, you know, um, and I think that's actually really important is, 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 I mean, the reason why I tell a story is because like, you, know, you, you talk about the importance of the wire and how difficult it is to, but, but had they succeeded and they, they would be at least inside the newsroom now, right? And then, and then. Oh. And for a news organization, I mean, credibility is pretty much everything you have. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing you have. And, you know, again, we've been around for 160 years, you know, before really light bulbs and, <laughs> or whatever. I mean, certainly before television and the internet. And all it takes is that one hacker or, was, you know, somebody to put in like a row in a database that feeds mm. the wire that just has like some terribly, you know, horrible, you know, profanity laced racist thing and it's over. I thought it was particularly unfair that the FBI targeted you guys in that. Uh, <laughs> so I was I was reading Comey's open letter to the New York Times this morning. I thought it notable. Uh, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar, the FBI, uh, uh, an agent of the FBI, essentially impersonated the Associated Press in order to um, uh, entrap a teen uh, bomb threat suspect, and 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 just one of the most telling elements of, of Comey's letter was that uh, they did this because they knew the kid was a narcissist. So I think part of the security lesson here is don't be a narcissist. Yeah. And, and always be aware that you are dumb enough to be hacked, but to be compromised. This is about me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and not to mention when I saw that story, it was horribly grammatically incorrect and not in AP style. So I was like, yeah, right away. That's not, uh, no editor would let that story move ever. I remember hearing, so. though, that there was some I can't remember the source, and I can't remember the way that it was worded, but some ancient, like, uh, Chinese proverb that talked about how um, you're, if, if you have, if you're ruled by vanity, you will always be vulnerable to attackers who, um, who flatter you. So, yeah. I think that's a great way to wrap up the panel <laughs> with a Chinese proverb. Um, so thank you all, um, and thank you to our panelists. And uh, I think we have a short break and then breakout sessions.